everyone. It's Doug Woodward. I'm just having a great time here with uh, two of my friends from a decade ago. And actually, I've stayed, you know, current with with uh, with one and not as much with the other. But anyway, we're going to get together. We're going to do what I think is going to be a great show. We're going to uh, look at what's happened over the last 10 years since the three of us wrote and published a book called the final Babylon. So let's see if I can hold that oh. up. Is that coming through? Yeah. Is that coming through? So yeah, very the final good. Babylon. Very good. And so, uh, yeah, we published that in two th in June of 2015. So we're just about three weeks and before the 10 year anniversary. So we uh, debuted the book at, in Colorado Springs at a prophecy in the news. Uh, may it rest in peace uh conference <laughs> prophecy watchers, prophecy it's watchers is still going prophecy in the news <laughs> is is deceased by about oh really two, i did not three know years that. yes yes it, it oh, ended my. it ended soon after i had done uh about 10 uh, of the interviews and then <laughs> really <laughs> Is there a causal connection? There? Yeah, I'm hinting that there is, but there's not really. <laughs> but it seemed it seemed funny to say. So, uh, oh, so my. anyway, so we're going to talk about world issues. We're going to talk about uh, what's happened to America over the last ten years. The thesis of the final Babylon, which I'm not 100 percent with, until ten years later, but I'm still pretty much with. Uh, the thesis is that America is the final Babylon. And so it uh, in the book, it basically says that it's both the daughter of Babylon from Jeremiah 51, 50, 51. But also it says uh, the book says that it's mystery Babylon, which is in Revelation 17. Mm -hmm. Babylon the Great is uh, is discussed in Revelation 18. So uh, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. That's going to be one of the themes that we'll kind of get around to. And we'll probably mm -hmm. vote at the end about <laughs> whether we still think America is the final battle. Yeah. Yeah. But I have a suspicion that uh, the, the verdict's going to be pretty much what it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, so, without further ado, let me introduce uh, my com compadres. Uh, you know him well, Doug Krieger and Dean McGriff. So, gentlemen, welcome to the hot seat. And uh, I'll turn on uh the gallery view here for a second so people can see all of us and then we'll uh, we'll jump in and, and we'll start mm -hmm. talking so let's see here tell us a little bit about what's happened in your life over the last 10 years i <laughs> i would love to know and i think there's a few people out there who would like to know as well so please uh enlighten us if you would i've been uh <clears throat> working with some people who are trying to do Christian communities around the country and okay. South Dakota and down in Arkansas. And uh, I, I think, you know, just preparation in general, but, you know, not that we're going to avoid any, <laughs> any of the problems that may come our way, but uh, doing that and uh, just <clears throat> still following, following the news, following the economy, especially mm -hmm. um, very interesting. So that's now you it. were, you were, um, one of those uh, economic hitmen, as I recall, uh, I was in in, uh, in one of your <laughs> earlier uh, renditions. Not to not to use that word wrongly, but uh, <laughs> tell us a little <laughs> bit about have you been have you followed at all USAID? And have I been what, hitting anybody yeah. lately? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, I, I I really have been involved in a in a very interesting project out in Indonesia, mm. and I spent hours on it every day practically uh it's a uh, oil refineries that are tr they're wanting to build out there the saudis realized that and all the emirates realized they needed to get their oil out of the middle east and into a place where it's a little safer okay. and so they're, that's oil building. production not storage though correct well they happen to do both <clears throat> okay. you know because if you don't move it very quickly, you have to have a lot of storage available. Ah, okay. So they're, they're building half a dozen refineries in Indonesia now. Wow. Well, that's kind of one thing I've been involved in. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. All right. Well, and I know you've been uh, enjoying some travel, and uh, that's got to be that's got to have been a nice uh, break for you. Oh, it was great. My wife and I took off in our trailer and traveled for about eight years. Gosh, All over. it was fun. Life. I definitely envy you that. So uh, I'm still waiting to have uh, a vacation. I haven't had one in about 12 years. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, it's time. It's time. It's, it's time. time. Definitely it's, time. It is time. So, all right, Doug Krieger. Doug Krieger. Mm -hmm. This guy has also been really busy the last ten years. Doug, I don't want you to take you know more than two or three minutes, but tell us kind of what you've been doing. Well, over the last ten years, thanks to uh, S. Douglas Woodward. <laughs> I have uh, gotten into the publication business myself, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we're at about 65 books now Wow! Uh, that have been done for other people, as well as uh, my own writings. I have uh, written about 15 books during this period of time, and uh, of course, as you know, uh, by 2015, when we met Doug, mm -hmm. I had retired from the public school system. Right. Of which I now uh, am very thrilled that I have. <laughs> but yeah. uh, uh, in any event, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, I have looked at our original thesis of uh, America. I always call the book America the Final Babylon. Mm. I don't usually entitle it the Final Babylon. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the secondary title is America and the Coming of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I probably am more uh, emphatic about uh, what is going on in the geopolitical world today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than perhaps I have ever been. But uh, very, very busy the last 10 years. Uh, we are uh, involved in a variety of ministries in which the emphasis is upon the unity of the body of Christ and answer to Jesus's prayer in John 17, with regards to the fact that when Jesus said, I'm going to build my ecclesia, that what he had in mind was a very participatory, contributory environment where God's people could come together, each one having a portion of the Lord's gift and ministry in their own lives to be shared one by one in our gatherings. That sounds uh, great. Yeah. Yeah, yes. and it has been very, very, and then I'm involved in a men's ministry. This is my shirt, freedom. Okay. All right, you know, kind of a William Wallace affair. Oh, and, uh, okay. Well, you got the nails. It's very there. much that way. And those uh, are probably the nails of the cross, though, aren't they? Yeah, this is. Yeah, you got it. The nails yeah. of the cross. See. Yeah. And then yeah. we uh, we have a tendency to nail things on the cross, literally, uh, <laughs> in the form of, you know, whatever is holding you back from uh, moving your life on with the Lord to bring it to the cross and to leave it there and to move on with your life with the Lord. So that's uh, sort of what right. we've been doing. And uh, right. uh, <laughs> by the way, you know, for those of you who do not know who I am, you know, uh, <laughs> I found out over the course of the last 10 years that I'm a direct descendant of Martin Luther. So the nails are very important to me. <laughs> <laughs> right on the Wittenberg door. Yeah, right on that Wittenberg door. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's been, it's kind of a, a joy to me to yeah. have uh, known that association. And yes. And to, uh, to move on with the Lord. So Great. that's a little bit about my background. All right. All right. Well, um, it's been, uh, you know, just a fantastic journey, I think. Um, a lot of people have read uh, the final Babylon, and it it still appropriately states the, you know, kind of the core position that we started off with, that mm -hmm. America is the final Babylon, and the subtitle the coming of the Antichrist. Of course, that's really one of the the real key factors. Is in fact, does America birth the Antichrist? And if so, of course, we all have to stop and say, okay, well. Well, who was that? <laughs> so let's start off with, you know, kind of some of the, the basic thoughts. I guess the first one, the first uh, way that we start the book off is we we say Rome has not revived. And by that, we were basically either just asserting or lamenting that the, the teaching that we all kind of grew up with of Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, Tim LaHaye, um and all of that 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 the way that the prophetic scenario was structured was that it was all going to be 10 european nations the common market they were going to come together they were going to rule the world america would just sort of disappear because of the rapture of the church because there are so many americans that are christians it would just devastate the country uh we'd like to think that but we kind of don't think that and uh and so yeah, the law of diminishing returns has sort of yeah. set in 
that's that's true so so let's do a kind of a quick assessment you know in terms of our view of uh you know has europe has it supplanted the united states as the as the primary political and economic power and military power uh that's dominating the world let's start with that what do you guys think well i mean europe doesn't even have an army of its own offensive <clears throat> so uh, there isn't much they can do and they're they've shown themselves to be incredibly weak in their economy but the one thing i wanted to emphasize in what you you alluded to <clears throat> is that we are rome <laughs> mm. in other words the roman greek roman culture culminated in america just like the little horn came out of the ten and ruled the ten in revelation and so uh for us to say we're not european belies the fact that we're speaking english we mm -hmm. have our our courts our legislature all of our laws based on roman law or english and so forth so there's been a migration over to the west but um it's across the ocean and just the fact that they couldn't describe didn't know who we are they did a pretty good job describing it not only that but we've been identified as israel's only friend which you would all attest to right right well and, and look at the look at our statues and monuments in washington dc that are basically greco roman yeah, they sure are and, yeah uh, right and so the greco uh, roman culture uh, we are the dominant force in making that happen notwithstanding we're also the primary force in uh populizing po uh, popular uh populizing making popular uh american culture around the world popularizing popularizing my radio thank voice you. Thank, that you. Someone, I normally have. thank you sir Audio. that was helpful in getting in my proper verb form so, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, uh, you never so know what, when you need one <laughs> that's right so tell us krieger what do you think about is europe revived uh you know if if the lord were to come back soon you know, would we? I, I, yeah, to, yes. To, I, to I want to. Uh, I want to disabuse some of my uh, prophetical partners out there, <laughs> and and these are hills I'm not necessarily willing to die for. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think that our understanding of the geopolitical of world is extremely uh, uh, valid in so far as there I am again. Yes. In so far as the uh, current situation goes, I heard the other day that there are, in fact, I just received a message uh, on my internet from a very well known prophetical ministry that the United States uh, is currently being overshadowed by the uh, old concept that uh, our dear brother Hal Lindsey popularized about the 10 nations that you've alluded to mm -hmm. arising in Europe and that we're just one of the gang at best or maybe not even there now that we've been raptured out of here mm -hmm. uh, as you again alluded to so uh, that Dean Dean is uh, nailed it on the head uh, you look at the current struggle between Russia and Ukraine or between Russia and NATO with us leading the charge. We have contributed, participated. We have troops in Poland. We have troops in Romania. We have troops in the former Baltic states. And we have a lot of troops. Over we have Russia. troops in yeah. Ukraine too. Yeah, that's another. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to go too far. with. We, what, we just don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah we, we don't just want to talk about, about that. It. Yeah. And so... You know, with the Hawks and the current administration, the so-called neocons, uh, and the perpetual machinery of war mm -hmm. that has uh, beware of the military-industrial complex. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, it is in this country and throughout the world in fine fiddle. And to say otherwise is ridiculous. It's in such fine fiddle that they could get rid of a person like Tucker Carlson, as far as I'm concerned, mm, mm -hmm. and do so with great finesse and abruptly. Uh, the criticism that uh, Mr. Carlson, Dr. Carlson, actually, with his PhD. I didn't realize he was, was a PhD. Yeah, he's a PhD. Uh, cool. Absolutely. 
he's a brilliant man. But he's very anyway, smart, yeah. yeah, very smart. And of course, he was thought, well, eh, you know, he was a uh, a Putin stooge uh, eventually uh, proclaimed <laughs> as. And, and currently, his uh, uh, character is being besmirched by a raft of uh, uh, you know individuals that are uh, ganging up on him. But right. this military industrial complex is so strong and so powerful that to come up against it is absurd. Uh, right. It would take with what we have still have 11 of these gigantic uh, aircraft fortresses mm -hmm. and what 40 to 50 uh, Trident submarines with their nuclear capabilities uh, roaming the, the, the uh, oceans of the earth. There is no way the Chinese and or the Russians could ever uh, catch up with the military industrial complex that we have put together over the course of the last, you know, since Teddy Roosevelt, quite frankly, and uh, as a result of the Civil War, even in this country, where we became truly a world power. So, well, do you think that the all of the talk about China as mm -hmm. our uh, new nemesis, Russia, mm -hmm. sort of sinking into the background, if you will. Do you think that's just propaganda to uh, encourage Americans to support uh, more spending in the military industrial complex? Frankly, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, let me just be overtly uh, 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 overt on this matter, because for China to think that they could, uh, you know, take Taiwan uh, with the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, uh, other southeastern uh, uh, nations of Asia, South uh, Southeast Asian nations like Vietnam in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, who looks at China as the enemy? And, yes. uh, and let alone Australia, New Zealand. I mean, that whole complex of nations is is desperately reaching out to the United States right about now. What we're doing in Guam, for example, a lot of people are not aware of this. We have made Guam a major military uh, expression, if you would, in the uh, in the uh, Western Pacific. And that has resulted because we, we're moving out, you know, almost completely out of Okinawa. We realized that that had pretty well uh, run its course. And so with Guam, we're able to do far more uh, military uh, endeavors. And, and also, we, you know, what do we have, Dean? I think it's something like uh, 10 to 20,000 Marines, no less, uh, stationed in Australia, uh, oh. which is uh, phenomenal. We're and also building, that. building and rebuilding all kinds of bases in the Philippines. Yes. Yeah. So we're we're very active in in uh, Asia, very very active. It does it and, does appear uh, that we are um, potentially setting up an opportunity to have a war with China in the South mm -hmm. China Sea, probably limited there. Although the threat of nuclear missiles coming our direction, you know, remains um, almost a probable outcome if we went to war with either Russia or China. Yep. <laughs> Well, let's get biblical here, uh, Doug. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's dive well, in. Let's let's get biblical here with regards to the uh, kings of the east and rumors from the north will trouble him in Daniel chapter eleven. Mm -hmm. What are we really looking at here? And I have uh, put together a presentation over which I've never really given an actual kind of animated presentation on the mm -hmm. so-called what I have dubbed the three prophetic wars of the last days. Oh, that's great. And Let's. Uh, I've, I've enabled you to share your screen because I think mm -hmm. you have a, a slide that can be a good place to uh, talk from. And the scriptures, getting biblical here, that I have taken, uh, the three wars, let's just cut to the chase. You're looking at a map of the Middle East, mm -hmm. primarily, and... Uh, also, the East India, you're looking at parts of the European states, Africa, a little bit of the North there. But the three prophetic wars that I see in Scripture 
have to do with the Oracle of Damascus. If you look at the chart right, under, right underneath the three prophetic wars, mm -hmm. you'll see Zechariah chapter 9. And I, let me just briefly talk about the Oracle of Damascus. Could I, for just a second, interrupt sure. me anytime, guys? Go, no, go but ahead. I, but I believe that there are three primary wars. One is called the Oracle of Damascus. The other is the Gog Magog War. This is in red. And down below is what Dwight Pentecost of Dallas Theological Seminary, the late Dwight Pentecost. I remember that. He, I remember. He entitled it the Armageddon Campaign. It's not yes. a battle. Mm -hmm. It is a series of battles. It's a whole war. And he dubbed it the Armageddon Campaign, which would happen within the context of the end of days. And uh, just as a, a brevity on this, when I was in Israel, uh, Back in the 80s, uh, I was told that the uh, Jewish people, that the Israelis, uh, were not really predisposed or did not know that much about the book of Daniel. Because certain rabbinical figures over the course of history had placed a curse upon reading, in particular, uh, Daniel chapter 9. Hmm. It was a shock to me to find out that the provost of Bar Ilan University, who also was a, a professor of English for the Bar Ilan, the largest Orthodox university in the world, that he was absolutely unfamiliar with the Book of Daniel. Yeah. And uh, but then, lo and behold, I found uh, 30 Israelis in kind of an upper room setting. It was a shock to me. Mm -hmm. I was invited over for strawberries and chocolate. Mm -hmm. And I went into the room, all Israelis, Jewish completely, right? And they said to me, uh, please, could we hear about the book of Daniel? Do you think, uh, Mr. Krieger, that we are living at the end of time? in the book of Daniel, and where do we fit in, and where do you fit in? Of course, I was not adverse. To oh, boy. Okay. You talk oh, about yes. an open door being laid. It was kind of like of a, well, and it was shock to me, because I hadn't heard that they're not supposed to get into the book of Daniel. Uh, that man. is a misnomer. Yeah. And uh, they are very interested in the prophetical understanding of the scriptures as it pertains to the book of Daniel. I bet. And uh, so we, we started getting into the Oracle of Damascus, the Gog Magog War, and the Armageddon Campaign. In the Oracle of Damascus, Dean and I, I think it was, Dean, was, weren't we at Doug Shear's place when we we shared on the Oracle of Damascus? It was an outdoor barbecue. Oh, um, yeah, it was out in the front yard, yeah. Yeah, on the front yard. Yeah, yeah. And this was this was before the current uh, Syrian civil war, so-called. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been talking about the Oracle of Damascus, that Damascus and Isaiah 17, and Zechariah 9, that it was it was going to become a ruinous heap. It would become a ruinous heap. And of course, Damascus indicates all of Syria, just like Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. constitutes the united states and so forth mm -hmm. so in zechariah 9 in particular it brings forth you know john woolward called the book of zechariah the the, the stereoscopic eschatological vision <laughs> of the greatest book for prophecy ever written mm -hmm. and uh outside of the book of revelation of course but but uh, but very uh, insightful of him to declare this now, i want to bring out one thing in Zechariah chapter 9, it talks about this oracle of Damascus and the destruction of Damascus and so forth. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I believe it's Zechariah chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, right in through there. It says, behold, your king is coming to you. He is meek and lowly and riding on a donkey and the colt, the foal of a donkey. And of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. What is that all about? And why is it right there at the Oracle of Damascus? All four Gospels record Zechariah 9 in those two messianic verses. You think that's important? Now, I think that is so incredibly wonderful. Okay, I, <laughs> I have a tendency to get excited once in a while. 
Okay. Yes. Especially about this. Why would the first and second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ be recorded immediately following the Oracle of Damascus? Doug, I believe that we mm. are living in the second coming of Christ. When the Messiah is presented, he is presented in his first and second comings. Amen. All in two verses in Zechariah, right after the oracle. So we're living in that yeah. messianic anticipation. I've got to move you along to, to some other things here in your, in your three prophetic wars, but mm -hmm. that is a tremendous insight. And uh, yes. again, another one that I hadn't realized. So I continue to be taught by Doug Krieger. Uh, and I thank you for that. That's that's really a great. great isn't it, isn't it amazing? There's yeah, no other reason. Amazing. You well, can't now, explain that. Yes, I know. So now my next question is: mm -hmm. Where is the Psalm 83 war, Doug? The Psalm 83 war is really uh, connected to the God Magog war, quite frankly, because it involves okay. Elam, okay. and uh, and that's Persia. Yeah, and, and that leads us to war number two. I was going to say the the Psalm eighty three war though is has of course been put forth by Bill Silas who's done a lot of great work but it's a uh, it's one that that you know it looks like that that really is not uh, part of the prophetic scenario of the end times that it really referred to a historical event in the time of King yeah. David so uh, yes. anyway I just wanted you to bring that out or talk about that for a second and then move right on into Gog Magog if you would yes. That, that comes out also, Obadiah talks about that uh, mm. Elam uh, mm -hmm. circumstance. Yes. So you have you have that war interjected here, but I believe it can be incorporated into the alliances uh, that are clearly mentioned. Now, if you look at the Oracle of Damascus on the chart, you'll see Syria and the, the, the ancient names, Hadrach, uh, Hamath in the north, Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon, modern Hezbollah, Gaza, ancient Philistia, modern Hamas, the stronghold of Ephraim. And by the way, when I was in Israel, the Israelis said, uh, guess what? Ramallah is to us the stronghold of Ephraim. It's the mm. modern West Bank and the Palestinian Ooh. Authority. They're right. all involved in this war. Uh, uh, and they and represent you, Ephraim in that sense then, okay. Right, right, at that point. And then also, there, I thought Jordan was not involved, but as it turns out, uh, one of the changes I've made on my chart is that mm -hmm. uh, there is some indication that the areas of Jordan and they're given as they're given as ancient designations, but they have modern day uh, equivalents. Yes, absolutely. Now, yeah. So you go into the Gog Magog war. I have now, to comment Gog, though, real quickly, that go it's good that you are still showing some of your dispensational roots because you have yes. to have a chart to be able to explain. Yes, without a chart, the people perish. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's why they say that there's, uh, you know, the thirty-minute silence in heaven. Uh, yeah, in but Revelation, they arrange, they rearrange their charts so we can rearrange our charts. <laughs> yes, Clarence Larkin. Yes, the there you go. Where would we be without those neat little drawings he did? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Well, so God, the God, 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 God War hits. Yeah, I yeah, think go that's ahead. the question is is uh, well, first off, I should say to close off on the Oracle of Damascus, um, do you feel like that uh, that the destruction of Damascus, yes. you know, what has happened, has in fact been a fulfillment of that prophecy, or is there yes. sort of more destruction to come? Do you think? Well, uh, yes, I do. Uh, on both answers, number okay. one is that when we had that barbecue and talked about the Oracle of Damascus, it had not yet happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sharing some of this through some some of our websites, had a gal call me from Damascus, and she said, Mr. Krieger, I would uh, prefer that you not talk about <laughs> Damascus and its destruction, because I live here, and we have a very <laughs> beautiful city, and, and by the way, we have uh, the outskirts of Damascus, the oldest uh, continuously inhabited city on the planet is damascus and she was correct mm -hmm. and i said well honey if i were you i'd clear out a dodge while i was getting <laughs> was good and well, uh, we could tell that to about 11 million people in new york city too right yes <laughs> yes well in fact in syria 14 million people 
have become refugees. Mm, 14 yeah. million out of our original population of somewhere around 25 million. So over and half. So over half of the population of Syria uh, have left. I could uh, name a few American politicians that are at fault for that, but it would not be allowed by YouTube, so I won't. Oh, okay. Well, we won't go. Oh, we're regulated under the YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we oh. have to watch what we say. We like I know. I, we like to uh, get by the way, video By the way, I, I, I want to just share something uh, real uh, that's associated with this chart. Okay. When I started talking on this, I was uh, contacted by the Department of Defense mm. about my analysis. Mm -hmm. And they said, where are you getting this from? And I said, I'm getting it from the book of books. And they said, uh, we find your analysis very fascinating. Uh, and we're just wondering, how are you coming up with this stuff? Yeah, no kidding. It, this uh, is no joke. Okay. Yeah. So that anyway, is amazing. And by the way, that that's fantastic. By the way, tell us, what was the outcome of the 30 Israelis in the upper room that you talked to? Well, yeah, it went on for three hours, which was As unbelievable. They just kept asking questions. It, go, right. it went into midnight, and I finally yeah. said, I'm somewhat exhausted, folks. Uh, is there a way we can uh, wrap this up somehow and uh, maybe talk about this at a later date? And uh, But the, the end product was they were just all excited, and it was just so much uh, uh, of a blessing to be there and to mm -hmm. talk about the scriptures. And no I said, you know what's, uh, what's that? No altar call? No, we didn't have an altar call. Uh, okay. It was a. Uh, it was like we were all at the altar to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You know, uh, and uh, I said, you have to understand, the two witnesses uh, prior to the the uh, uh, witness of, of, of the olive trees and the witness of the lampstands, I have a, a theory on that, that the the Old Testament, the New Testament, which is the Seventh-day Adventist kind of teaching anyway, but that the uh, uh, God's elect are constituted in Judah and uh, the uh, Ephraim that has uh, been swallowed up of the nations and that his elect are coming from both the uh, olive trees and the lampstands, which are the churches, and that these two in the latter days are corporate witnesses uh, to the uh, to the deliverance wrought through the Messiah, and mm. that Messiah, of course, we affirm to be our Lord Jesus and the uh, and the uh, and the Jewish people. I think are uh, predisposed those who really believe the scriptures uh, to uh, Mashiach ben uh, Joseph, yeah. the Messiah as seen in Joseph. Yeah, and uh, so uh, we'll see here. As God opens it up. But anyway, the second war is the Gog Magog War, and I'm with Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who believes that will happen at the commencement of the 70th week of Daniel, of which we're approaching very closely. And uh, by the way, that woman called me back in Damascus and, and <laughs> said, uh, I, This is interesting. After, you know, her home was destroyed. She yes. lives in the suburbs of Damascus. Yeah. And she said, How did you know all these things? Yeah. And uh, in my uh, great humility, yes. I said, I, I got that from the book, the book of books. And uh, but anyway, very yes. interesting. And uh, yeah, so well, but it leads and feeds into the Gog Magog War. Mm -hmm. And that's found in Ezekiel 38, Daniel 11. And then the Gog Magog, King of the North, the Chief Prince of Mishak and Tubal, Gomar, Togomar, Persia. King of the South are the, is, is Ethiopia. I, I had at this point put in uh, Kush and Ethiopia, but the King of the South really is not Kush. Kush is ancient uh, Assyria, actually. Mm, yeah. And then, uh, and then Kush, Kush of is, the North. Yeah, right. Kush of the North. It's not mm -hmm. Kush of the South, right. although there is a Kush of the South. But yes. this is the Kush of the North. And then Libya, Egypt, uh, all the northern tier of African states. Versus, now check this out, versus Israel, the glorious land, the willful king of Daniel 11, the merchants of Tarshish, which in our book, folks, mm -hmm. you've got to get this book because it's <laughs> relevant to this day. Still and relevant. Third, it's still relevant. It's more mm -hmm. relevant now, Doug, than ever. That's and true. And thirdly, Sheba and Dedan are the modern, uh, modern states of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. I did have on here at one time modern Jordan, but I see Jordan more involved 
uh, in the uh, in the uh, Gog Magog war mm. and so forth. But anyway, Armageddon campaign is the after the forty days, I believe it will take because in Gog Magog you clean up the weapons and the land over a uh, over a, uh, a seven year uh, time frame mm -hmm. and uh, seven months. Then you have seven years and uh, and so during that time is the Armageddon campaign because the Antichrist, after the conclusion in Daniel 11 of the Gog Magog War, which is seen in Daniel 11 and in Ezekiel 38 and parts of 39, then you will see that he, the willful king, will hear of rumors from the north and from the east. The east is mentioned first, then the north, and I still feel that that will be the uh, World War III, I hate mm -hmm. to say it, yeah. but uh, I don't think that the Lord is silent with regards to the end of days, the end of time, as far as we know it as now, and that he has given us major clues in the scripture as to the unfolding of these cataclysmic conflicts at the end of days. Right. What we are witnessing right now in Ukraine is the solidification of NATO as led by the United States of America. If you don't think we are at the forefront of that conflict against Russia, then you are just whistling in the breeze somewhere. Mm. We are not only at the forefront, we are utterly leading the charge militarily with equipment and with so many other aspects of this thing, even though we feign as if we are this uh, uh, freedom-loving, you know, democratic. Uh, oh yeah, oh, we are. Know, we're so freedom-loving. That's freedom what we're trying to do. Democrat. Very peaceful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very, very right. Peaceful. Yeah. Well, do we yeah. have? Uh, you know, let me ask uh, Dean to to jump in yes. here, give him a chance to chit chat with us. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that our current administration is uh, is keen to get us into a war? Mm -hmm. uh, and what what do you make of the Ukraine uh, event as part of the I guess the the lead up to the Gog Magog war. Well, I don't know how much we should say on this format, but it certainly yeah. looks that way, doesn't YouTube it? YouTube is watching you. Be careful. Be careful about what name you names you use. I mean, you it, does, it doesn't <laughs> seem to appear that way. You keep right. kicking the the, the uh, bear, and you kick the lion, uh, the tiger. Right. And then, yeah. We'll just say the administration. That's all. We'll, right. All right. Say, right. Because I mean, this this country just to, have to remind everybody, uh -huh. um, during the last administration, we were the number one producer of natural gas and oil in the whole wide world, mm. and and we could very easily return to that and just right. Uh, so you no, know, I mean, our our whole history is built around our ability to produce energy, and that's what gives us our our wealth and our power and everything else. But um, for example, in the Permian Basin, of West Texas. They just recently jumped, according to the USGS, from 22 billion to 46 billion barrels of oil in their reserves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're just awash with oil, which we can't get at very often, very easily. But we're also awash in natural gas. Mm -hmm. And that pipeline kind of blew up uh, spontaneously in the <laughs> bottom of the ocean, you know. Yeah, it wasn't that <laughs> spontaneous. We had, and and we, had nothing, we had nothing. No, 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 no. Of course that. not. I nothing I, I, I might have been some well down there chewing on the pipe or i, I don't right. know what but at any rate then then uh, of course <laughs> europe we saved them this winter because they started building ports and we started one thing that this administration a lot of people don't know we had three lng tankers the tankers that carry this frozen gas when uh, biden took office and he built 20 more in the first two years of his administration, he's building another 20. So he knows that this is a hot commodity and it saved Europe's uh, bacon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but at any rate, I mean, we, we are still, you know, that country that has tremendous reserves as a breadbasket, too, because we've been you know, wiping out breadbaskets here and there. Yeah. Yeah. We, <laughs> we, we have somebody destroyed the breadbasket in Ukraine. Um, yeah, you know, we we kind of think we know who did that, but <laughs> could right. it be Putin? Well, anyway, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> that we that's a name we probably can mention, you know, because <laughs> we can probably so, mention that. That's right. 
probably can. Uh, well, that's that's great, and it's so true. And that's one of, really another one of the sort of core uh, mm-hmm. assumptions in our book. Is yeah, that there really is there really mm-hmm. is no other country or a series of countries or alliances that can mm-hmm. bear, you know, that can catch up with or yeah. equal to the capabilities, the resources, the, um, you know, even manufacturing capability, although we got to be careful about what we do and don't manufacture in China, but, you know, we're, we're number one. And, uh, mm-hmm. and if you think about it, you, you know, Russia has gone down to its GDP lower than Texas. Oh. state of texas yeah it's not, so it's, it's, not it's, it's not looking not good it's not looking good for them mm. and china's mainly in paper tiger it's just paper it's a, it's a facade but there isn't they built these cities and the cities are empty they built the suburbs and the suburbs are empty that they they're really good at building things but they can't carry fall through so right. i'm not mm. worried about them yeah well there's that there's that uh analyst a uh, consultant it's all over everybody's uh interview talking about the the end of the world is just the beginning um mm. and he's predicting that china will be basically uh completely uh without you know any any ability to uh to project power you know within less than 10 years and it's all based on demographics yeah they their their population is decreasing like crazy yeah because they kept the, the two birth thing and it was really below to way below Mm-hmm. and uh they're they're just cruising for bruising mm-hmm. and people you know, jumping out of windows we have a lot of hispanics if if we want to send some of our immigrants <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> he didn't say that he really didn't he didn't say, say that he didn't say that <laughs> definitely <laughs> but but he also speaks spanish so that's, uh, that, spanish. that's true he does speak spanish he, very yeah, well he, it's very yes. redemptive yeah <laughs> <laughs> say he's he, this is kind of like Tucker Carlson and what he said, you know, and uh, and of course yeah. he's accused of being a racist for making comments like that. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so yeah. all right, so let's go back to uh, I, what I wanted to, to do to introduce the Gog Magog War, um, Doug, if I might, is comment on the um, you know, the theory of the Islamic Antichrist, yes, and that the one of the core uh assumptions of the gog magog war and in that theory that scenario is that the antichrist and gog are one and the same and that Mm -hmm. there is only one final war and it's really the gog magog war Mm -hmm. and the armageddon campaign all wrapped into one and and once it happens jesus comes at the end of that and that's the end of the you know natural history until uh, jesus takes the throne in jerusalem so Mm -hmm. what do you you know this is over the last 10 years joel richardson who's a great brother oh yeah uh Mm -hmm. but he has been very successful in promoting the islamic antichrist point of view and uh Mm -hmm. so what what are your thoughts on that that's certainly something we should speak to well let me disabuse you of that one too (laughs) because the fact of the matter is that in the gog magog conflagration it would appear that Satan's kingdom is divided. What do I mean by that? If he had it his way, he would destroy every human being on the face of the earth because he is going to be defeated by Jesus Christ who has led many sons and is leading many sons to glory. And therefore, the captain of our salvation will not be defeated. Uh, Humanity will persist upon the planet and his kingdom satan's kingdom is divided between the forces of the antichrist and those forces known as the gog magog uh, con uh, uh confederation of mm-hmm. states in the last days in other words the willful king of daniel chapter 11 is identified with the merchants of tarshish And we have to understand that is the ancient Phoenician commercial empire that was absorbed by the Borg, known Mm -hmm. as the Roman Empire, who defeated Hannibal so well presented by the articulate person of Doug Woodward in our (laughs) book again, which I want to put out here. Okay, 
Folks, anyway. I didn't pay him a, a fee for this promotion, but I <laughs> but I do appreciate it. But, but the thing of it is, is this. Uh, and, and I know it's quite popular uh, to take the blame off of Babylon the Great. Uh, Babylon the Great kept moving ever westward. Part of our thesis is that Babylon is the heart of the great city that kept moving. The Persian Empire kept moving westward, as you know, challenging. You remember the movie, The 300, and then mm -hmm. they were defeated, Artaxerxes and so forth. And then we have the Grecian Empire and ever moving, ever moving westward. And then Rome itself, ever moving westward and then contending simultaneously with the Phoenician commercial empire and eventually uh, the Borg absorbed it. And <laughs> interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, this westward movement through the uh, pillars uh, of Hercules, uh, mm -hmm. through uh, Tarshish of the Iberian Peninsula, not the Tarshish of Antioch, but the Tarshish of the Iberian Peninsula, which is where Spain. the right, which is is, is Hispania and so forth. Right. They were the ones, the Phoenicians, who we presenting in our book, actually is there is a multitude of evidence that the Phoenicians were trading all over North America, up the Mississippi, down the Lawrence. Uh, St. Lawrence Expressway, you might say, <laughs> and then they were all over the place, right? And so, so um, we're saying that uh, a, a good dispensational teaching is that Babylon the Great eventually is judged. Mm -hmm. In uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 17, there is a religious expression of Babylon, the woman who rides the beast. Then there in Revelation 18 is the judgment of commercial Babylon. And the merchants of the earth stand afar and witness her smoke rising up in one hour and so forth. We could talk about that. And then thirdly, political Babylon, the administrative uh, hub of Babylon, the great city, is eventually destroyed with Satan, the false prophet, and so forth, uh, being dispensed with uh, uh, by uh, the intervention of Christ himself. And so Doug, those let me, three Let me aspects, ask you the comment on... Um, the connection between the Phoenicians and the Canaanites mm. and the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. Well, first of all, the, the, the a very good observation on that one, Doug, because the word Canaanite, interestingly enough, at the last verse of the book of Zechariah, you find a very peculiar verse. It says, never again shall the Canaanite ever have access to the house of the Lord, to the temple of the living God. In other words, when Jesus threw out the merchants twice, the merchandisers twice from the temple, he had something in mind there in the book of John. And what is of interest to me is why does it say the Canaanite will never again be in the house of the Lord? Because the word Canaanite literally means merchandiser. Mm -hmm. So the merchants, the merchants of Canaan, you have the 11 sons of Canaan versus the 12 sons of Jacob. Okay, you have this incredible uh, uh, juxtaposition. And 11 signals the number of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. Haman and his 10 sons. Judas made it 11. Okay, you have the little horn with, out of the 10 making it 11. And so 11 versus God's government of 12, the triune God, three with creation, four, three times four is 12. And you have this 12 versus this 11. Mm. So you, you begin to look at Canaan, the land of Canaan, the God's 12 are going to possess the 11. Can you follow mm. me there? Oh, yes. So they are in the land of Canaan, and in particular, the epicenter of the land of Canaan is Tyre and Sidon. You have the king of Tyre who morphs into, quite frankly, Lucifer, the son of the morning. He is the archetype of Satan, okay, mm -hmm. the king of Tyre. Uh, Tyre and Sidon were known. 
for their uh, the commencement of the purple people, the Phoenicians. You heard the Punic <laughs> Wars, the purple people eaters, right? Right. And they they are the uh, purple people uh, due to the fact that these mollusks that were in the Mediterranean Sea near Tyre, you it take a thousand of them to get a little thimble of purple, but it goes a long way. It's a dye they use. You know Lydia the purple dyer. There you and then are. you've got this strange expression in the book of Revelation about all they that dwell, uh, that, that use purple uh, for their uh, – uh, purple is judged in Revelation 18. Okay, mm. And so you have this amazing uh, uh, purple people, Phoenician in Greek, Punic in Rome. Okay, And so these two are actually the same people. And so mm -hmm. the Phoenicians kept moving their commercial empire ever westward, and they started in Tyre and Sidon as the Canaanites. They're the ancient Canaanites, for goodness sake. Hannibal was a Canaanite, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you've got these Canaanites moving. These merchants of the earth are moving. These ships of Tarshish, these merchants of Tarshish, ever moving westward to Spain, which discovered the so-called New World, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, very fascinating history here. Right. And and uh, I think that uh, the way that we have synthesized it, all three of us in all humility, is staggeringly brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing with the Canaanite. And yeah, the well, thing uh, of it is. It, that, like, I was just going to say, just to underscore mm -hmm. what you're saying, is that 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 really is a mainstay of our thesis is yes. that America is the epitome in today's world of the merchants of Tarshish, of Absolutely. the Canaanites, of the Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. That's the empire that we mirror. And mm -hmm. so uh, anyway, so that's we make that point very, very clear uh, with your able uh, help in the uh, in the story <laughs> and deans as well because we talk a lot about the dollar right. uh yes you no know, yes what the dollar is where it comes from dean you might just the pillars of hercules yes you know, the pillars that. of hercules the S around the two yeah. yeah yeah so um anyway dean, and you by might... the way that map Second. that we came up with of, of the ancient coin of the uh -huh. phoenicians right. with the world on it wasn't that something Yes. Well, this makes you want to go out and buy our book. <laughs> <laughs> He's just jesting with us, I assure you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So what well, this is an opening, though, and we'll come back to Gog Magog in a second. But, uh, Dean, this is an opening for you to talk just a little bit about the the economics, the, the origin of the dollar, uh, and how that reinforces also the... And where it's uh, going. Of yeah. The book. Yeah. Well, and then the ultimate destruction of the dollar, which we're seeing, because if uh, if there are too many, they're not going to be worth much. And, <laughs> That's uh, true. And, you know, we I, I actually have a, a hundred hundred million dollar Zimbabwe dollar, hundred wow. million dollar bill dollar bill from Zimbabwe. So that's that's the worst case scenario, which is why we'll probably go to some kind of a Fed cryptocurrency and. Uh, once they do that, we're just one step away from the mark of the beast because um, it, it's just they're in control of everything, every everything economic. And um, you mean, well, Dean, you... I can't buy an oven in New York now. I can't buy a gas oven. Is no, that you what you're trying to tell me? An electric wow. oven, an electric <laughs> oven, and you can buy an electric car. And, ah. yeah. Well, just to, let's talk a little bit just about that, about the destruction of the dollar that has certainly, um, you know, over the last ten years, that has really been a, a major theme. Mm -hmm. um, you might talk, Dean, just a second about the BRICS and the mm -hmm. threat that the BRICS are, because that's real current right now in terms of right. the, what the BRICS are trying to do vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. -vis, uh, the dollar as the reserve currency. Well, the, the, the BRIC nations are Brazil, Russia, China, India, India uh, and uh, India. One? There's one more, isn't there? South Africa. South Africa. There you go. At, yeah. at any rate, I mean, you know, they're, they're so jealous of us because what we did, as we said, because we basically controlled the oil of the world, we made all of this dependent upon 
you want to buy it, you buy it with dollars. You want to buy oil, uh -huh. you buy it with dollars. You want to buy a, a Ford, you buy it with dollars. You want to buy this, that, or the other thing. And so the dollar became the currency of the world, which gave us the power because everybody had to change their currencies back into dollars. And as, but, but these up and coming nations, so to mm -hmm. speak, they're the up and comers are looking at it very jealously and saying, this is, we got to break up this monopoly. Uh, this just isn't right. So we're going to, you know, create our own reserve currency. China wants to create their own Ooh. on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's all, uh, everybody's kind of out or the big guy on the block, you know, everybody's right. out the top of our pedestal. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, Russia and Brazil are in a lot of turmoil, uh, Brazil right. politically, right? So in terms of, of them actually being able to come together and force a new reserve currency, it, it doesn't seem likely despite all the predictions yeah. of the of the death of the dollar. Is that your point of view? Well, I know I, I think the dollar is going to do just fine. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it will die. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's so far we've been able to hold on in these other countries don't have their trip together so to speak and and so uh you know india china they they just don't so um once our mm -hmm. energy interest industry is revitalized and it wouldn't take too much to do it because remember we have all we have we're the number one oil and natural gas producer in the world and uh, we're still sitting there on the in the in the sidelines not using any of our resources All right. <laughs> we're buying this stuff for everybody else and we're not talking about the strategic oil reserve yeah i mean we we still have we still have the goods mm -hmm. so we'll have no problem you know dictating what's going to happen um but for some reason there's a person that's trying to destroy you know the, the country and i can't imagine why I, yeah, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> somebody tried so, to destroy the country. Well, the, the point that, that I want to make sure that we make clear is that the dollar, which, you know, we uh, conjecture uh, the two lines through the S, that those mm -hmm. are the pillars of Hercules, which, of course, yes. uh, is a well, yeah. and what, and what could the Iberian Peninsula. What could the S be? Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Espana? I don't know. <laughs> But uh, the dollar is the currency of the merchants of Tarshish. Oh, that is, is really where we were going with that. And yes, lo exactly. and behold, what does the U.S. mint and what is the U.S. economy based on? The dollar. And yeah, what the is dollar. the world currency based on? The dollar. The dollar. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it's going to be very difficult to get off that dollar. It's, it's going to be hard to knock us off our pedestal in time and who other, what other country is Israel's only friend. Mm, yeah. That's right. And, and, and again, that goes back to the God may God war yes. because the ships, listen, the merchants and ships of Tarshish, which we have identified are allied with Israel in the uh, books of Ezekiel and of Daniel and especially in Daniel. And well, both. OK. And oddly enough, the nations of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula are also in Gog Magog allied with the ships of Tarshish and with the beautiful land. And so uh, mm. that's already happened with the Abrahamic Accords, uh, mm -hmm. Doug, and uh, the fact that Saudi Arabia did not enter into that, but the United Arab Emirates did and Bahrain, and Qatar, and Morocco, and some of these other states, but especially those of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Yes. Uh, and because you have come down for a spoil. I remember when uh, Wolverd talked about, hey, just take off the SP, and that's what they're after. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, uh, again, this Islamic Antichrist is a false flag because it is apparent that the northern tier of nation states where you've got gog and by the word the the name magog simply means the allies of the principality known as gog okay mm -hmm. which appears at the beginning of the uh millenarian rule and reign at that final seven week time frame 
and at the end of the millennium, uh, if I want to be a good dispensationalist, I have right. to say that. Yes, I do want to say that emphatically. Yeah, and that then your creds. That, yeah. that's, that's one of the that's arguments that. against Gog Magog being at the time of Christ's coming, because yes. it's, what is it, Revelation twenty or twenty one that yeah that, uh, says that the uh, that Gog and Magog arise again after the yes. millennium and are finally yes. put down forever. So, right, that's a, that's a nice yeah. millenarian contestation, right. and then right. that's fine. And that's fine. Yeah. Well, now, yeah. one of the things that that I've argued, I want this to kind of feed back into the Gog Magog mm -hmm. thing, is I've argued in a couple of books, uh, the next great war in the Middle East, uh, American mm -hmm. Requiem, um, mm -hmm. that America is identified as the daughter of Babylon, right? Of of Jeremiah uh, fifty fifty one and mm -hmm. uh, a few other verses, but the daughter of Babylon is uh in my view is distinctive from mystery babylon i now mm -hmm. believe mystery babylon represents apostasy yes it represents apostasy of right. not absolutely just, not just the catholic church but right. you know any protestants that like Episcopal, Methodist, Presbyterian. Yeah, we have plenty of our that, own. Yeah, <laughs> we have that, a lot of daughters. I'm no, not naming any names now, you know. But, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, but uh, anyway, apostasy. You know, mm -hmm. Dean, you like to talk about apostasy. Um, there's a lot of that, isn't there? <laughs> yep, there is. Yep. And so I believe Mystery of Babylon is that. I believe that the United States uh, is the daughter of Babylon and is part mm -hmm. of Babylon the Great. Now, the yes. question that I raise, a view that I have put forth, which I believe is consistent with uh, the late Grant Jeffrey, uh, perhaps even with Arnold Fuchtenbaum, although I can't, I don't know for sure, but Ga Grant Jeffrey, yeah, uh, maybe Chuck Missler. But anyway, there's mm -hmm. a, a view that the daughter of Babylon is taken out before mm -hmm. the, Gog, the war of Gog and Magog. And well, and there's Israel, some evidence to yeah. that. Yeah, because the willful king does move his headquarters between mm -hmm. the sea and the beautiful Israel. Well, yeah, so mm -hmm. the headquarters is moved. His mm -hmm. tent, right? His, uh, yeah, his tent is moved. His so, tabernacle is moved, right? Yeah. So, so the position that I've kind of uh, have grown into over the last ten years is that the United States is the daughter of Babylon. And I believe I've argued that really clear, uh, clearly and thoroughly in the books I've written uh, during the last 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. And because it is, it is, um, you might say, defanged, maybe not completely destroyed, but defanged. And um, it frees up the possibility for Israel to be attacked by mm -hmm. these other nations uh, because we are so uh, much in turmoil that um you know we're well, not do you, we're uh, well how do you see that doug if i could ask you this question i know mm -hmm. you're the the moderator here but yeah. do you see do you see the diminishing of uh the uh the, the nixus of babylon the great the daughter of babylon through civil strife within babylon the great or yeah. through a an ex nuclear exchange or some kind of a, a diminishing to the point where uh we are defanged as you right. presented right and then we have to move the headquarters moves between you know he'll set up his tabernacle in in the beautiful land so what do you right. see here well i i speculate i speculate that there is a nuclear mm. uh, attack on america i'm not sure that that america strikes back uh but a number of cities in the united states i believe will be uh, victims of uh, nuclear attack from nations from the north, which is what it says in Jeremiah 51, um, mm -hmm. and that that will um, essentially take the United States sort of out of circulation. But it will not thoroughly destroy the United States military, because even if the aircraft carriers were taken out, there's still all these submarines, and most of those are going to survive. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh yeah, this event, and so there still is the potential for perhaps even an American leader, or perhaps mm -hmm. a king of England or someone like that, to mm -hmm. uh, in effect take control of uh, the forces of the West, which mm -hmm. could include, as I'm saying, uh, you know, a good chunk of 
the American military, um, you know, sort of for, uh, our capability, mm -hmm. and that still is rolled into, um, you know, the willful king, if you will. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah, that's that's plausible, very plausible. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, all the more to head for the Ozarks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Why do you think Chuck Missler moved to New uh, New Zealand? Yeah, the, that's the way. Did he move to New Zealand? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah he did. Oh yeah. Because yeah. he believed there would be a nuclear war and the United States would be taken out. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, he so did. I'm putting forth, you know, this idea. Unfortunately, I'm not happy about it, but uh, it seems to me, based upon reading Jeremiah 50 and 51, that uh -huh. it's very cl uh, clear. That the daughter of Babylon is destroyed by powers from the north, shooting uh -huh. their missiles over the North Pole at um, mm -hmm. the Western mm -hmm. Giant. So that's my well. My it would appear, yeah. It would appear though that that's uh, you know, I've thought of that uh, actually quite extensively, and uh, I think you'd have a very credible uh, argument, Doug. And I think that the current state of affairs now. Uh, Otto Fruchtenbaum and others, uh, you saw that chart that came out of individuals who affirm Gog Magog will occur the first 40 days or at the beginning of the 70th week and others before it and, uh, right. and so forth. And so I know on. I did a chart like that. I don't know who else has done one. but Well, I think you're, you're the only guy that did a chart like that. Yeah, I, I did that. In, uh, yes, yes, go ahead. You're being a little facetious, I understand. Okay. <laughs> Go right, go right ahead. Say <laughs> but, something but nice I, about I, me again. <laughs> but it, it, it was very impressive that uh, the individuals that you had on that chart, right. I mean, it would appear that that Gog, Magog uh, conflagration of, of those northern Islamic states, southern Islamic states coming up against the willful king. Why would Islam come up against Islam kind of a thing? That's why I don't I don't affirm that the Antichrist is some islamic uh right. leader erdogan notwithstanding and all that uh but i don't tell see... all of a sudden we've just heard is oh. uh he he's in very bad health that's just something oh, no that happened in the last day or two yes oh wow that's amazing and uh yeah i find that fascinating and my uh one of my websites was hacked by the uh uh as aslan the uh uh lion of islam and I was oh. hacked. Oh, wow. Yep. But I survived to live and fight another day. Yes. There you go. <laughs> That's right. So, so we're, what, we're, what we're coming up against here, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is the final judgment of Babylon the Great. There are only two cities in the book of Revelation of any magnitude. New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the holy city, which should be us, you, yes. uh, and I, by the grace Amen. of God. It is. And... <laughs> Babylon the Great. Now, when I go to Nigeria to visit my brothers and sisters over there, I always ask the very poignant question, and that is, how many hallelujahs are mentioned in the New Testament? Now, Doug Woodward, I'm not going to embarrass you, right? but uh, there's only four. And normally, when you see that word hallelujah or hallelujah in Greek, mm -hmm. it is mentioned. So when somebody cries out, well, hallelujah, you better know what context it is in the New Testament. And that is Babylon goes up in smoke and they all cry out, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's when you see the smoke will rise up and the merchants of the earth are judged in Revelation 18. And there's a big hallelujah that goes on. So every time you say hallelujah, brothers and sisters, you be thinking about that <laughs> stuff is going to burn up along with all of our wood, hay and stubble. Yeah, I mean, it's well earned, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well deserved. Well, now take us into, um, you know, this culmination of things in Revelation. Talk about the Armageddon campaign and kind of, kind of, uh, you know, is it distinct from the Gog Magog war, and Very. Uh, and so forth? Yeah, because that's really yeah. a distinctly dispensational point of view that we all still kind of hold to. And yes. um, so, if you would go in and explain that, that'd be awesome. Well, you know, the Armageddon campaign, uh, that phrase was coined by Dwight Pentecost, who wrote the book, famous book on eschatology, Things to Come. Things to Come. And I remember things that. Things to Come. Uh, just a uh, great uh, 
panoply of the covenants and the uh, the the wars and so forth. But he called it the Armageddon campaign. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see that in Ezekiel uh, 39, 17 through 20. Now, we always look at Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say, well, this is the God may God work. It is up to a certain point. But from Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20, everything changes. And there is this description of another war that is going on besides the Gog Magog conflagration. And you see the Gog Magog uh, war ending and you see something new beginning. And of course, in Daniel chapter 11, after the king of the north and the king of the south are defeated by the willful king, it says that he will hear of rumors from the east and the north that will trouble him. I just love the King James Version. He mm -hmm. hears of rumors and he's troubled, right? And then right. he says he will go out and annihilate many. And that is the campaign that Dwight Pentecost is announcing. Mm -hmm. Pentecost did a much better job, I would have to say, than the beloved John Wolver, who mm. just couldn't quite pinpoint he was the Daniel president, 11. but he was the president at Dallas Theological right. Seminary, just so you yeah. know. And he was president during kind of our college days, I would say. Yes, and uh, just a, he was a wonderful man of God. Uh, he and Dr. John Wolbert and myself, along with many others, went to Washington D.C. and held a major conference on affirming uh, Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy with Orthodox conservative and reform and revisionist uh, Jewish leadership uh, in Washington, D.C. at the Hebrew National Congregation. We yeah. all signed a document uh, to that effect uh, called the uh, Washington Declaration, and uh, it was amazing. You are and, old uh, school, aren't you? I'm old school. I'm into yeah. declarations and uh, whatnot. But back in the day, that was in the, in the 1980s, and... Uh, we had a great time there with uh, uh, John Wolbert and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aldridge from Multnomah University now. Multnomah, and, yes. Yeah, and they had, uh, you won't believe this, uh, Doug, but John Wolbert was dancing with the Orthodox rabbis uh, at an Orthodox synagogue. Rumor, it, I mean, I saw this. And John, uh, uh, Dr. Aldridge looked at me while John Wolver was dancing with the rabbis, and he said, they're never going to believe it. And I said, what do you mean, Dr. Aldrich? He said, imagine uh, John Wolver dancing with the prophets. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sight that hey, I can't that's imagine. That's a history, really. folks. You ain't going to get anywhere that's, else. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. Uh, yeah, you're just full of these anecdotes that are just I know, they're, they're, they're nice little inserts into the, they, the They're audience. a lot of fun. They really yeah. are. But anyway, Armageddon is this is this the culmination of battles that will ensue, and eventually uh, he will come to his end. The emphasis is upon the Antichrist. And by the way, the Antichrist is not called the Antichrist until it, 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 he is throughout the 70th week, the Antichrist. But in the middle of the week, uh, as a good dispensationalist and, and affirming Brother Hal Lindsay's uh, uh, rendition of this, he receives a wound in the head and uh, falsifies the resurrection. And from henceforth thereafter, he is entitled the beast. So the beast can no longer because his spirit, his human spirit is occupied just as Satan entered into Judas Iscariot to commit the dastardly deed of betrayal, mm -hmm. he was entitled the son of perdition by the Lord Jesus Christ himself yes. in John 17. Who is the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? None other than the lawless one, the Antichrist, the mm -hmm. beast. Okay? And so we have to you know, take the scriptures and put them together 
as to why he's called the beast as Nebuchadnezzar became the four-footed guy crawling around, his hair growing out, his fingernails growing out. And this is a beast. He was as a beast. A beast cannot fellowship with the eternal God. I mean, I love my dog, and I know Dean McGriff does. He loves his dogs and uh, cats. There's the dog, you know. There's so the just dog. Just so you know, you can tell. All right, now, but that beast <laughs> is not made to fellowship with the Almighty. I am, and so are you. And so a beast cannot fellowship with God, and neither can the Antichrist beast. He's been inhabited by Satan himself, All as right. far as the scripture is All concerned. Right, now, and that's why he's the son of perdition. That, that leads us to one of the, the fun exercises that we as dispensationalists like to um, you know, mm -hmm. engage in, and that is pinning the tail on the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Who could possibly qualify, if you oh. look at the world right now, you know what? What? What persons? And there are there are two or three could could step up and step into this role of the beast. I right. leave that to Dean. That's Dean, a Dean question. You, what do you think? No, 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 no. Let's get him in trouble. <laughs> not me. Uh, is this I don't know not the man. I don't know. For, for YouTube, <laughs> this is Dean McGriff. M little C G R I F F McGriff. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so go ahead. What do you th what do you think about the leadership that's in the world right now, the power players, uh, and if the Antichrist were to appear, let's say after uh, some type of nuclear exchange, which you know I believe is imminent, as in within the next year or two, you know who might step up and and play the role of or be the be the beast itself. Hmm. All right, we're waiting. Dean is speechless. He will lose his camera. The only, camera. The no, only I, one that I that I I always thought would just be the perfect candidate. And initials are BO. Yes. Yeah, I do too. I still, you know, yeah. you, can't, <laughs> you can't you can't get over that, you know, sort of two million people in front of the of the Berlin gate that he right. was speaking to. And the chills went up and down my spine when I heard about he, that. He's kind of Islamic stuff. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Yeah. So, what do you think, Krieger? Well, of course, I put my t uh, tail on uh, uh, several mercurial figures. Mm -hmm. That is okay. Look at if even the very elect can be deceived. What does that sound like? Okay. In other words, the elect could be deceived. Uh, and get really close to being deceived, right? Yeah, yeah. But then it sounds like they kind of wake up at the last second almost. Oh, my goodness, what have we done? Or, oh, my word, we are, we've been following a certain person, and now, alas. There, there is this, a, another uh, Islamic guy whose initials are RW. Oh, yeah, RW. Now you're wondering about what that is. Yeah, now I, yeah. I'm now I'm trying to think about who that is. Well, how about how about a you know? Did you guys ever read the book um, "Having a Cup of Tea with the uh, Antichrist"? Oh yeah, the Antichrist in a teapot. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was done by uh, who was that done by down in Costa Rica or something? It, it, right? it, yeah, it was done like 15, 18 yeah. years ago. So mm -hmm. do you know what I'm referring to? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, well, as far as yeah. King Charles goes, you yeah. know, uh, that is a, that's a prospect. Yeah. Very much so. Order and, of the Black Garter. Uh, yes, the Order of the Black Garter. And, that's really uh, and, and also this peculiar thing about the, the, the uh, throne of David and its uh, whereabouts in, in the British Isles and uh, so forth, and that, uh, you know, during the coronation, uh, they sit on that very throne. I think you're aware of that. Yes. And they claim that that throne is the uh, throne uh, of David that went through Ireland to Scotland, and then it came down. Uh, yes, uh, supposedly it, it's the it's yeah. the rock that Jacob 
lay his head on yes dream yes. of uh you know ascending and descending yes. into heaven with the angels yeah right uh, that's what it's supposed uh, to be it's actually yes. supposed to be called by some the holy grail yes yes it is yeah. this is now, there's a lot of credence to the uh antichrist in the teapot uh phenom uh actually a very very uh interesting uh, uh which leads me to be believe that when i journey to england in september uh, those of you who are listening out there in uh, uh, video land uh, should uh, uh, look for me at Honor Oak in uh, London uh, in September. I'll be speaking on some of these matters yes. in southeastern London. Oh wow, that's just fantastic! Yeah. You have you have well, some great opportunities. I don't want to say I'm envious of it because it involves a lot of travel, which I'm not real good yeah. at. Yeah. But uh, but golly, it sure is exciting to be able to, yeah. to talk to people about these things, and especially if you're mm -hmm. addressing them from a long ways away. Yeah, when we went to Africa, we have a uh, a uh, school over there that we started called the Equi Christ Ecclesia Institute, which brings together we have folks from about 150 different ministries and denominations. It's a two year program bringing the body of Christ together. But while I was over there, just so the folks can know, I know that Nigeria is in great upheaval right now, financially and in so many other ways. And yet the desire among the Nigerians and so many Africans is the desire to reach out for the Lord in the midst of their suffering and poverty and abuse. And uh, while I was there, I had the amazing opportunity of visiting perhaps the largest assembly of believers I have ever seen in my life under one roof. Now, mm -hmm. folks are not going to believe this, but they can look it up. It's called the Redeemer Church of God, which is the largest uh, ministry denominational affiliation uh, in Nigeria. And they have outposts all over the world. And they have this one facility, Doug, that you're not going to believe. Four miles long, three miles wide. And there were 12 million people in that assembly. Good grief. That's you amazing. have never in your life could believe or see such a incredible throng of believers. It was wow. amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. 12 million. And that is not, hey, the Rose Bowl seats 100,000. <laughs> Figure you know, 120 times that. Oh, yeah. How Can do you, you fathom that? that? Yeah. It's just hey, and, and my first question when I saw that crowd was, where's the bathroom? <laughs> 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 and, and, and you can't believe the roof system, you know. Oh, uh, the it's good to get your bearings. Great, it's the most amazing place. It's a whole city. They have a whole city. Hotels, banks. Uh, grocery stores, gas stations, everything, a whole city uh, that uh, that houses this. And then this gigantic, gigantic facility with yeah. giant screens and huge audio systems. It's a marvel of, of unbelievable oh, wow. proportion. What a great, yeah, that's amazing. Oh. Well, listen, yeah. we are getting, we're getting close to our time limit here. Um, and so why don't we try to wrap this a little bit uh, around the question, what comes next, you know, in terms of events that would trigger the, uh, the war of Gog and Magog, because I think we're, we're sort of past the destruction of, of, uh, Damascus and we're ready yes. for the war of Gog and Magog. What would trigger that? What are you Iran's thinking? Well, having the nuclear weapon and Israel's not going to stand for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I would think they're going to probably use Damascus, Iran is, as a proxy to launch it. And mm. then Israel will take out Damascus at that point. Mm. It will become an absolute lunacy. That will be the trigger mm -hmm. of Gog Magog. Wow. Now, I have said in my book, the uh, uh, signs in the heavens so and on the earth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, show us your book cover. Do you have it handy? Well, I, I think I may have a cover of it here somewhere. But, is this the uh, well, one I wrote well, forward this to? Is, this is Doug Woodward's cover yes. that yes. got me there into trouble. But anyway, yes, there it is. I, I, there it is. I, 
I don't yeah. honor copyrights too well. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, um, what I said. I copyrighted the, the Orion constellation, basically. Yes, you, yeah, there you go. So you can do that. But anyway, uh, I had said in there that the a, the, the date, I just love setting dates. Me I and, know. Uh, what's fun. his name? Uh, the guy uh, that, uh, oh, Harold Camping. You know, yes. Uh, the the 1994, then the year 2000 something, and then I went way the dodo and and uh, but I had calculated uh, along with Bishop Usher. I know that your book on the Septuagint and so forth and so on uh, would indicate that uh, we've been around a lot longer than uh, six thousand years and so forth. Right. But I had calculated that the creation of Adam was in uh, uh, three thousand. Uh, 975 BC, and that the end of our six day, 6,000 year allotment by God Almighty would end in 2025. And that would commence now that I understand it more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, the final seven years, which would conclude in the year, the first three months of 2033. And it's interesting to note. Mm -hmm. That from 33 A.D., which was, I believe, the, the Catholics are right on this and some of the church fathers, that mm -hmm. in 33 A.D., in the first three months of 33 A.D., was the crucifixion of Christ. And that 2,000 years from the crucifixion, or from Pentecost, if you would, until 2033 would be two days or 2,000 years, it fits perfectly. And so I did not have that understanding when I determined that 2025 would be the commencement of the 70th week, the final week. And then the seven year time frame is so unique, so outside of the 6,000 years. It, it's during that great transition that the Almighty would affect all of those uh, wars that would be ending until he would come. And the wrath of God would be poured out. So, yeah, that is. Uh, I'm I'm sticking with it. Yeah. And seeing what happens. And by the way, uh, people say, "Well, no man knows the day or the hour." And you know how I feel about that, friends, because <laughs> it says in the days of Noah. It's not that they did not know that there wasn't going to be a flood, but the fact of the matter is that they were probably helping Noah build the boat, right? And and uh, they didn't want to know. But if the master of the house who was guarding the temple would have known when the thief mm -hmm. to check up on whether or not he's asleep or not was going to come in his watch, he would have been prepared. And all of us need to be prepared for the thief. Jesus said just before Armageddon, he says mm -hmm. that the thief is going to come and that you should watch in chapter 16 of the Revelation which mm -hmm. is great for pre-tribbers because the Armageddon <laughs> happens at the beginning. <laughs> there's I just only thought one, I'd throw a bone for you, brother. There, there's only one of us that represents that uh, that point of view. So, And he served today as your moderator. So, uh, so, But yeah, but these guys and I have had a lot of fun um, kind of in that debate about yeah. when the rapture occurs and so forth and it's, by the way we hope we're rooting for you yes. we're, uh, we, yeah, we're all in we're all in for you to be spot on i, I know i know that's, that's so true so well this has Good. been from my standpoint it's been a fantastic time and yeah. uh there's you know we we only kind of scratched the surface of some of the issues i feel yeah. like we need to come back and talk more about the campaign of uh, armageddon because there's a lot in that that I have an inkling of an, of awareness of that mm -hmm. is not commonly known, even by some of those really good dispensationalists. So, so Doug, maybe we can come back and talk more detailed about that and look sure. at the scriptures uh, more, you know, diligently because because I know it is enlightening, um, and uh, again, it's um, it's a point of view that actually we kind of this is kind of where Joel Richardson sort of gets some aspects of this right but mm -hmm. he just wants to he just wants to map um the gog magog or and the campaign of armageddon as the same thing uh mm -hmm. and the antichrist as the mahdi uh you know that's and gog they're all mm -hmm. one and the same so um and we disagree with that of course so 
So anyway, well, guys. Now, now let me ask yeah. you this question. Okay, what, go what, ahead. What what new book are you coming out with regarding some of these matters? <laughs> okay. Well, I have <laughs> I have two books that I'll mention that I've written in this past year. One is called American Requiem, and that uh -huh. book sort of revive, it kind of revisits some of these issues, and it talks a lot about the old um, and understandings of Revelation. Uh, from you know, the last four or five centuries. So I do some study of that uh, in American Requiem. And of course, then I get into, you know, what are the things that, that cause us to believe that America really is destined for, um, you know, a real bad day, let's say. And uh, then the other book that, I, that I've written is Will Babylon Be Rebuilt in the Last Days? And okay. uh, I'd love to, you know, sit down with you guys and go, maybe go through uh, that book and uh, and that could kind of tie into the campaign of uh, of Armageddon and so uh, why don't we uh, plan to get together again in a few weeks and talk about sure some enough. things? Yeah, absolutely. All right, and and I th I think one thing that we want to keep in mind too, Doug, and and of course I think that you know during the uh, turn of the century of the going into the nineteen hundreds. There was a thing in the New York area called the Niagara Conference, in which they had uh, pre-tribulationists, post-tribulationists, all kinds of different aspects on biblical prophecy. Brothers and sisters would come together, leaders in the in the evangelical movements, and would not uh, they would be firm in their own convictions, but at the same time, they realized that the unity of the body of Christ was altogether more of a great need than ever before. So they would come together and speak of Christ as our life. They would have uh, their prophecies of the second coming, their, their aspects of that. And then they would uh, culminate their gathering with consecration and missions and go out from there to evangelize the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, uh, that, that those kinds of conferences Mm -hmm. would do all of us uh, so well if we could uh, come together around the throne, if you would, mm -hmm. and begin to realize that a doctrine, uh, a prophetical doctrine did not save us. The person of Jesus Christ, the doctrine mm -hmm. of Christ, is our salvation. He is our deliverance. He is our Yeshua. He is our, you know, that's one thing I tell the Jewish uh, folks is I say, you know what? There's only a couple of people on the planet that believe in deliverance, that have a Passover. And I said, we are together in that, that the deliverer will come out of Zion and then all Israel will be saved. And uh, so I want to emphasize the fact that our unity that we have in Christ, regardless of our prophetical uh, convictions, but we can hold convictions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we are doing here in the unity and brotherhood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much, Doug. That was a great way to wrap our session up. And um, anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about uh, getting busy again with the hot seat. I've got uh, several additional interviews semi lined up. And so I'll All be right. looking for, uh, be looking for those. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and, and, yeah. and hit that little bell so that when I do send these, uh, publish these videos, you'll know about it and you'll go watch them. What, so, what's the website? Yeah. All right. The website is in YouTube. It's the hot seat uh, associated with Doomsday Doug. Um, and of course, I'm on Facebook. My website is faithhappens.com, faith-happens.com. And Great. you can find the books we talked about, uh, the book we talked about today there, or you can find it at Amazon. So uh, anyway, appreciate that very much. Okay, gentlemen, until we talk again, God bless. Goodbye. God bless. Good to see you again. Thank you.